Hello, Jack. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm from Westbourne Grove Church in Notting Hill. And it's just a joy and a privilege to be uh, with you today. And uh, as we share a few thoughts together about Psalm 36, I'm just going to be reading from the NIV. Psalm 36 is actually very short. It's just uh, 12 verses. Uh, the middle section is probably very familiar because it turns up in lots of worship songs. But it's actually a psalm that addresses uh, the problem of evil and how we cope with evil in the world. So I think it's quite good to see that middle section back in context. So I'm going to go through it section by section, um, just to kind of unpack it a bit, and then we'll kind of round up at the end about maybe how what we do with it and how we apply it. So the first verse of David, the servant of the Lord. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. But this word message actually translates the Hebrew word for oracle. So this psalm is actually quite unusual because mostly we think of it as being a, a prayer to God. And there is a prayer at the end of this psalm. Uh, but it's actually also about a prophetic word. It's an oracle. It's God revealing something. There's a statement of the big problem right at the beginning. There is no fear of God. Now, this is, you think, well, it's a statement of the obvious, but it's actually an unusual Hebrew word that's used. Fear of the Lord or fear of God is usually a word that means a sort of healthy dependence on God, an acknowledgement of our need for him. And that's not the word that's used here, because it's almost as though the message is these guys, the people who've given themselves over to sinfulness and wickedness have gone beyond that. What it actually is saying essentially is there is no trembling before God. It's like not only do they not rely on him and they don't even acknowledge his power, this is complete disrespect it's a kind of dishonoring of god uh, that they're, that's their, their sort of heart's attitude but what does that lead to well in their own hearts they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin the words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful and they have failed to act wisely or to do good what he seems to be saying is that people who've given themselves over to this place of utter disregard and disrespect for god actually what happens is they become utterly self-centered, self-obsessed. And this blinds them and desensitizes them, not just to God, but even to what is good. They're unable to act wisely. And of course, biblical wisdom is about living well, not just being clever. They don't know how to live well anymore. And he goes on and says, even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. So, on their beds, you have this vision of someone lying in bed in the dark, instead of rest, rest, resting and sleeping and maybe praying a bit before they go to sleep, they're plotting evil. It's like it's become this obsession for them. It's consuming them. They commit themselves to a wrong pathway. Commit is this willful choice. I sort of wonder whether David has in mind uh, Genesis 4 7, when God talks to Cain and says, If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The message really is that sin is toxic. It's like this monster eating you, making you subhuman, and destroying people around you. It's a really powerful warning. Then we get a sudden transformation, change of direction, verses 5 to 9. Uh, it's almost like the smallness of the world of the evil man sitting in the, lying in his bed plotting evil is contrasted with the greatness and splendor of God. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. It's all pervasive. It's love, faithfulness, righteousness and justice, the character of God. Love gets uh, repeated again in verses 7 and verse 10. That's clearly at the, the forefront of David's mind. So you have this whole sense of an all-powerful creator with this awesome character of love, faithfulness, righteousness, and justice. All these things are the absolute opposites of the, the evil people we've been uh, reading about. Now, that one could seem a bit grand and a bit abstract, but then David sort of earths it down and says, okay, Lord, you preserve both people and animals. How precious is your unfailing love. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Uh, we worship a God who protect, preserves people and cares about animals. God is right down there, down with the chickens and down with the goats and the sheep. He cares. And in him, we have a place of safety and refuge. So it's incredibly reassuring. 
But that isn't the end of it. I mean, that would be pretty powerful in itself. But he goes on and makes a, a number of other really exciting statements, really. It says, they, that's us, we, we feast in the abundance of your hands. It's a picture really of God being the inc incredible, generous, welcoming host. And we are the honored guests. It's an extraordinary contrast to how other people at that time related to their gods, who were just exploitative and demanded child sacrifices and all those things. Feast on the abundance of your hands. It's a bit like preparing a table in the presence of my enemies in Psalm 23. Uh, Isaiah talks about the great feast on the day of the Lord uh, in Isaiah 25. And of course, in Revelation, we have the wedding feast of the Lamb. So it's something which looks absolutely forward to the future as well. He goes on, you give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. This river of delights phrase, by the way, the, the delights bit of it, it actually translates the word Eden. Yeah, the God of Eden. It's a reference right back to creation again. Fountain of life and rivers are what was called living water as opposed to standing water. Standing water is what we have in jars, cisterns, stagnant pools, that kind of thing. Living water is really rivers, streams, springs, fountains, that kind of thing. That was a contrast they had. So what he's talking about here is living water. And of course, that perhaps rings some bells when you're thinking about Jesus and the, talking to the woman at the Samaritan, the Samaritan woman at the well, where he's talking about, I can give you living water. Initially, he's, she understands him to be talking about water that's flowing, that's alive. Of course, then it gets to the deeper meaning about God as the source of life. By the way, only ritual, sorry, only living water could be used for ritual cleansing. So that is a whole lot of things we could look at there if we had time. In your light, we see light. Again, this links us right back to creation. It's the first thing God creates is let there be light, conquering darkness and chaos. Jesus, the light of the world. Revelation tells us that New Jerusalem is lit by God and the Lamb. So you have this link back to creation and the link forward to the completion of all things. Then you get the prayer. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. Again, just a, again, earth thing, these, these incredible kind of visions and pictures and metaphors to say, actually, we need your love right now. And we need your protection. Don't let the wicked triumph over me. And he finishes by saying, see how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise. It's almost like this is a prophetic picture, like he's seeing in his mind's eye, um, evil defeated, injustice overcome, all things put right, death defeated. It's a wonderful final picture to finish with, hence the exclamation mark, I guess, that the NIV translators have put in there. Let's just pull all these threads together. I mean, there's a, a lot that I've covered there and I've probably gone a bit too quick. Anyway, um, I guess it, it, it helps us to face this question about wickedness and evil, sinfulness, unrighteousness, injustice, all those things. Why are they, why are they in the world? Why do we have them? What do we do about all that? And also, why do the, the, the wicked prosper sometimes and the righteous suffer? How do we live in a broken world is really what this psalm draws us to. And it's really, I think, two parts, just to summarize. It's a warning about the destructiveness of sin in people and in society. So in that sense, it kind of is sobering. It's meant to sober us up a little bit and say, say look, this is so toxic, so destructive. So in a sense, it's a powerful realization, a sort of reality check, but also I think it's a powerful call to mission to save people from that kind of toxic destruction in their lives. But also it's about saying we don't want to see that toxic destruction in the society. It's about, it's a, it reminds us of our mission to bring justice into our world around us. And then it, as well as that warning, it's also like, well, how do we cope with all this? And this is, how do we cope with seeing evil flourish without becoming angry or just terrified or cynical or just giving up and despairing? And I think what David draws out here is a number of threads. He wants us to remember God's creation and God's creation plan, God's power, God's intention, how things were meant to be. He wants us to remember God's character, that love, that faithfulness, that justice, all of those things. And to contrast that with the gods of this world. 
He also wants us to remember the end game, the future plan, the feast, the day of the Lord, when all things will be put right, the day of judgment, when everything will be finally resolved and evil will be destroyed utterly and goodness and love will triumph. But he's also reminding us that it's not just pie in the sky when you die. God is doing stuff right now. He is involved and he is active. And this is a psalm which encourages us to, uh, to turn to God in thanksgiving for all the things that he's doing, all the protection he gives us, all the provision he gives for us. And finally, it's a reminder that we're not completely passive in all of this. This is a, a prophetic revelation sort of prayer, uh, uh, psalm, but it's also a psalm which includes prayer. We are to ask and to pray. We're not just sitting and observing. We are called and engaged in this whole process. So I hope that's a few thoughts that will be provocative in some ways, that will perhaps give you some fresh insights maybe, and will just help you to really appreciate this psalm when you read it again yourself. And um, so that's it. I'll, I'll leave that with you. And thank you very much. And just hope that's been of some use to you. God bless you now. Bye bye.